Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, August 17th, 2024. It was another great week of shows with great topics and, of course, great guests. We kicked off the week with a look at assessing the implementation of the blended retirement system. Let's take a look. So blended retirement system is just as it sounds, it, it's blended. It combines both a defined benefit uh, uh, component and a defined contribution component um, to service members retirement system. Prior to that, they were covered by what we can call a legacy retirement system based on the high three uh, of their salary uh, with a multiplier of two and a half percent. The changes to the moving to the blended was the defined benefit dropped from two and a half percent to two percent times years of service, and it added the, the defined contribution plan with a government match up to five percent, one percent government contribution up to four percent match uh, to service members' uh, TSP contributions, and they're automatically enrolled in TSP, the thrift savings plan, uh, which is equivalent to a 401k or 403b for for those who, who may not be uh, familiar with the term T- thrift savings plan or, or TSP. Um, individuals are uh, automatically defaulted in at five percent of their salary, so that they automatically get get the match after uh, two years, and, and they're vested after two years. The government one percent starts, uh, I believe, ninety days um, after uh, service begins. And there are several other interesting components of the blended retirement system. In addition to the TSP, uh, it, during the window between seven years to uh, 12 years of service, if the individual is still with the department, they are eligible for what's called continuation pay, which is a bonus paid in um, exchange for um, additional years of service. And then the other major component or unique feature about the blended retirement system is uh, service members who uh, complete over 20 years of service and and retire with the the 2% uh, times years of service uh, pension defined benefit, uh, they are eligible to take a part of that annuity as a lump sum payment up front. And so, um, again, unique things which have uh, unique training requirements to that. Another interesting feature about the blended retirement system and the TSP component is um, if a service member decides to opt out of it, uh, the next year they're automatically re-enrolled at, at, at 5%. So yeah, you really want to have to be out of it to be out of it. And so, I mean, I think, and this is part of the really good news story of, of BRS before I, I give you, I kind of throw out some numbers. Um, so under the legacy system, only about 85% of uh, individuals who enlist or come into service um, as, as a private, shall we say, or a seaman first class, whatever, as at the lowest pay rate who, who enter the service um, or who are commissioned, only about 85% actually make it through a whole career. Um, and that's because the military, you know, you, you need more specialists and, and junior enlisted than, than you need uh, general officers and things like that. So. Uh, with 20-year cliff vesting, uh, about 85% left with no retirement savings. With the blended retirement system and the TSP component, that, that there is now a portability component to uh, the retirement system. And so uh, currently, the uh, Thrift Savings Board, um, or otherwise FRTIB, which manages the TSP, um, they report that... Uh, about 1.4 million members uh, accounts are BRS accounts. Now that's a combination of individuals who are who are currently serving and who have who served under BRS and have decided to keep their their accounts in TSP. And um, the report uh, uses December 30th data, which was about 28 billion dollars in in accumulated retirement wealth. Um, but I just actually emailing this morning with a colleague. Um, he provided me some updated numbers. So there's uh, one point, about 1.4 million accounts. And at the end of June, uh, the retirement wealth uh, held by the uh, individuals having BRS retirement accounts in um, TSP retirement accounts is now uh, $33.4 billion. Um, and that represents about 
five and a half years over the lot, only five and a half years of uh, BRS. So we think that's a great news story that uh, you have about 1.4 million people who may not have uh, enrolled into TSP under the legacy system because there was no match. Now we're covered and have a portable retirement wealth of uh, $33.4 billion. That's, that's, that's a pretty uh, astounding feat, I think. Back in 2021, we talked about the financial, um, the, the, the steps that the department had to do uh, to transition the workforce uh, into uh, blended retirement because there was a, a certain population that had uh, the option to stay with the legacy system or to uh, opt into blended retirement. And so we had to train about 1.6 million service members in uh, the, the plan, uh, but that also involved uh, making sure they understood basic financial literacy and, and, and all of that. And so we just didn't talk about the plan, but we went all the way back and you know reviewed everything from basic uh, investment concepts, basic savings concepts, from compounding inflation, learning about diversification, uh, at, at very high level and, and things like that. And then we developed training, not only for that opt-in population, but now for anyone who comes in into BRS, um, they get training on the plan, uh, not only once they enter, as they enter the service, but to get training throughout their career um, because not everything applies uh, when you're a young 20 uh, something uh, young man or woman and your future isn't, your focus isn't on 20, 30 years from now. And so we talk about the importance of planning and saving for retirement, uh, some of the key features of the BRS, such as the portability feature. And then when we get to the vesting window, uh, they receive training on, again, vesting, what that means. Um, and then when they hit the window for um, continuation pay, we give them training on continuation pay. Um, and then when they get ready to separate, whether or not they're separating because they serve four years or they're retiring at 24 years, they get training on you know, what, what to do now, especially with their, their options with their TSP, um, whether to keep it in, roll it over, and understand that if they decide to cash it out, the, the taxes and penalties that, that they may pay on it. And if you're retiring, then we have you know lump sum training and a lump sum calculator um, to to do that to help them understand what uh, you know the future value of money and what they might be giving up in terms of a annuity that uh, is adjusted for inflation every year versus taking a a reduced uh, lump sum uh, payment and that. So we have you know all these things. We look at uh, retirement training as just a part of. Uh, uh, holistic financial well-being training um, so that an individual can be in charge of their money both now and in the future and uh, can handle financial shock both now and in, in the future. Next up, we discussed studying aging and incorporating findings into new products and services. Let's take a look. No, it's, it's a great question, Jeff, and one that we get asked often, uh, you know, what is John Hancock's stake in in what you're doing here, particularly with the, the life insurance, the retirement, all of the different services that we offer. So particularly John Hancock, you know, the main thing that we're focused on and our mission and purpose drives us is to help our customers live longer, healthier and better lives. And when you think about that, that is something that we should care about, right? As a financial service organization, as people are living longer, what are they going to need? right? They're going to need that. They're going to need the financial stability. They're going to need the financial protection, but we want those years to look better. We don't just want them to be longer. And so it's really this combination of what we've put together through the opportunities that we've created through the financial protection and stability of the products that we offer, as well as the ecosystem of partners that we've been building around the longevity space. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable, Jeff, to see how much has changed really over the past not even five years, but in the past two or three years, there's just been this drastic evolution of science and technology. And we've been very fortunate to stay very close to all of these organizations that are on the cutting edge. 
So the partnership and the collaboration with the MIT Age Lab is really just our next foray into that idea of longevity and really that aspect of, again, not just that living longer, but that living better and how can we help. And so as we build out this ecosystem of partners, particularly this collaboration with the Age Lab, it's really going to focus on the research. And we're, we've collaborated together on creating a longevity preparedness index. And it's the first of its kind, we're co-creating it together, but it's really to help us understand how prepared are people for a longer, healthier, and better life? And what can we do to help support them once we have those findings? So it's a really exciting collaboration that, uh, that we're excited to be able to figure out what can we learn? How can we partner together? And what's been remarkable is, you know, you you sometimes look for partners everywhere, right? We want to make sure that we're getting the best of the best. And what was really great is as a Boston-based location, while we looked everywhere, all we had to do was look across the river and be able to see MIT there, being able to work with Dr. Joe Coughlin and his team is truly remarkable. If you've never had the chance, Jeff, to head over to the Age Lab, it's really quite amazing what they've built there and what we've been able to bring some of our partners through, some of our employees through. We did a great press event there a couple of weeks ago, and you get to really experience it. You get to see the home of the future, which has indicators on your floor to not only tell someone when you fell, but to help detect a change in your gait, or it has different monitors and things around your home. You get to see the car of the future, not just the not just the ones that are running off of energy today, but the cars that are self-driving. And there's this full simulator that you can actually sit in and go through. So to think about the future is something that the Age Lab is doing every day, but they're doing it, like you said, Jeff, with that population of aging. And we're really excited to tap into what they've been doing over there. Well, we're halfway through. We come back, we take a look at the other half. I want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the FIRST Lifestyle and Wellness Network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio-only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Welcome back. Next up, we discussed reducing the mortality risk of breast cancer. Let's take a look. It's the most common cancer in women. About, I think, 8% of women in Canada will develop breast cancer by the age of 75. So that's pretty common. It increases somewhat with screening and early detection, but that's a pretty fair number. It changes around the world. Canada is at one of the higher levels. The United States is about the same. It seems to be less frequent in Asian countries than in Africa. It, is there a reason for the frequency differential between, as you mentioned, Africa versus here in the States or in, in Canada? Well, that's a really important question, and there are various interpretations, but I don't think there's any hard facts. I think, uh, you know, some to extent we can think of it as the genetic makeup of the population, the risk factors that they are exposed to during their life, but I think also the screening, intensity of screening increases the frequency. Some cancers that are detected don't, through screening mammography, never would become clinically apparent. Those are considered overdiagnosis. So the more screening you do, the more cancers you're likely to identify. And so and countries with little screening will have less cancers than cancers with a lot, than countries with a lot of screening. Yeah, well, that's evolving, but I mean, certainly since the 1980s, chemotherapy has been offered to about half or a little more than half of women with breast cancer. The mainstay would be surgical treatment where the surgeon removes the cancer. Sometimes they'll remove the cancer alone, which we call a lumpectomy or breast conserving surgery. Sometimes if the cancer is larger, margins are positive, they'll remove the breast, we call mastectomy or unilateral mastectomy. And some people, if they have breast cancer in both sides, or if they have a BRCA1 mutation, or if they're particularly anxious about a recurrence, will have a bilateral mastectomy. That's really the patient's choice. But most women will get a lumpectomy followed by unilateral mastectomy. 
followed by bilateral mastectomy. Uh, a lot will get chemotherapy that depends on the size of the cancer, the nodal status. And then we have anti-hormonal agents, such as tamoxifen, which are given to women with what's estrogen receptor positive cancers. The cancer cells show a uh, receptor, which uh, indicates that they're sensitive to estrogen, that the presence of estrogen will lead, likely lead them to grow or metastasize. So we try to block the estrogen with a drug, an anti-estrogen, like a tamoxifen. And in some cases, we offer actually more extensive hormonal therapy, removing the ovaries altogether. So removing, instead of blocking the estrogen, we remove the source of the estrogen, which is the um, ovaries. There are other types of cancer, like which there are specialized treatments for, called personalized treatment. Or, for example, if you have the HER2 gene expressed in the cancer, we use an anti-HER2 treatment, commonly known as Herceptin or Trastuzumab. Right. Well, I think about 5% or maybe uh, of women who have breast cancer in one breast decide to undergo a bilateral mastectomy, both breasts removed, the breast containing the cancer and the healthy opposite breast. This is done for several reasons. Uh, some women believe that, you know, the risk of the risk of getting a breast cancer in the other breast is substantial. It's not huge, but it's about 7% over 20 years. And so women who wish to avoid that will have sometimes a bilateral mastectomy. Now, women with cancer in both breasts, which is a small percentage, will get a bilateral mastectomy as a matter of course. But if they only have breast cancer in one breast, a small proportion will get a bilateral mastectomy. Uh, there are several reasons for this. If you're going to have breast reconstruction, many times removal of one breast um, is, uh, leads to a asymmetric appearance, and the women would rather have both breasts removed and reconstructed in order to have a better body image. So that's a common reason. I think the most common reason is just uh, fear of getting a second cancer. And the ability, if you have a bilateral mastectomy, gives you the opportunity to skip radiotherapy, which is something I didn't mention, and uh, not necessary to go for screening every year to see if you have a new breast cancer. I think a lot of that's done to relieve stress, anxiety, associated with the fear or the concern that you might get a breast cancer in the other breast. But of course, uh, there's also the question some women doctors believe that the bilateral mastectomy, by preventing the second breast cancer, can actually reduce the chance of dying of breast cancer over the long run. Surprisingly, we found that uh, if you did get a bilateral a contralateral breast cancer in the other breast, you know, you were more likely to succumb to breast cancer to die of it. The, the numbers went up from uh, about 18% to 30%. So there's a substantial rise in mortality rate for women who experienced a bilateral breast cancer. But surprisingly, by doing the bilateral mastectomy, by doing the removal of it and preventing the second breast cancer, we didn't reduce the mortality rate. So the mortality rate in the three groups, chance of dying with a unilateral mastectomy with a lumpectomy or with a bilateral mastectomy, was about the same over the 20-year period where we followed these women which is somewhat of a paradox. One would think if the second breast cancer was common enough and had the potential to kill you, that preventing it would be a beneficial option. And finally, you may want to reconsider your relationship with caffeine. Let's take a look. Uh, correct. So coffee has the highest amount of caffeine when, when we compare to chocolate tea and um, energy drinks. It depends on, on what energy drinks um, you're getting. But anyway, um, caffeine is a psychoactive uh, compound that is widely used uh, um, everywhere. Um, it's, um, it's actually, it has some addictive property. This is why people would like to have their uh, coffee in the morning, but also it has some positive effect. If, because it's a psychoactive, it means it's, uh, it stimulates the brain. By the stimulation of the brain, we have better uh, performance of the brain. We have better uh, release of certain 
feel good chemicals like dopamine for example dopamine is a uh, uh, is a brain chemical that motivates you that that gives you some, that's good of, the boost of energy like mental energy so this is why it could be addictive it, it also has some addictive properties but it's all, also addictive to these feelings to these good benefits i agree i think it it was first introduced from the the asian countries where they have um, the coffee bean, the tea leaves were were harvested and then slowly were introduced to Europe and then to the Americas. For some people, uh, two cups of coffee, three cups of coffee can trigger that. For others, maybe more. Um, it depends on the the genetic makeup. I um, I could say is because we have multiple enzymes that could be involved in. Um, whether we metabolize caffeine or we respond to the effect of caffeine. So if we have a genetic variant um, in these enzymes, we could be more sensitive to caffeine's effect. So you're saying two cups of coffee, right? So uh, I could guess that you're a slow metabolizer. Um, so what's the difference between a fast and a slow metabolizer? Is fast metabolizer, we have all the perfect working enzymes that uh, degrade or metabolize caffeine in a short amount of time. So those people tend to be drinking more coffee because they need to have the effect of caffeine um, replenished. Whereas slow metabolizers, they take longer to metabolize caffeine. So it stays in their system for a longer period of time. And when they over overdose, <laughs> which is like normal dose for, for fast metabolizer, they could feel the effect of caffeine uh, on their stress, on their uh, anxiety, um, and so forth. So so I would guess that you're a slow metabolizer. Um, it could, um, if, you're, if you're a heavy drinker for a long period of time, um, some studies have shown um, that people could have some cardiovascular issues, although there are mixed results with these uh, studies. So I think because the problem is the studies did not look into the genetic makeup of, um, um, of participants. And this is why we could see some, um, some conflicting results. Uh, but the studies that focus on uh, the impact of cardiovascular health is mostly because of the stress associated with high consumption of caffeine. Um, so we also have to say, uh, to mention that caffeine uh, or coffee, uh, coffee has polyphenols. These actually are antioxidants. They have beneficial effect, but having too much caffeine can counter uh, effect uh, of, um, counter effect the benefits of these uh, polyphenols and may increase the risk of cardiovascular health or increase uh, um, blood pressure which eventually could impact the effect or, um, or affect the function of the heart. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, then visit our website, we're back again tomorrow with another edition of BRN Sunday. We'll be taking a look at what's happening in terms of retirement legislation, litigation, arbitration, mediation on Capitol Hill, and then taking a look at the markets and the economy. So you're not going to want to miss it. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.